go ahead and make sure we're still recording and everything, but I think you should have full controls to be able to do screen sharing and everything and be able to take it away if you're ready to go. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm ready to go. And uh, I thank you all for your patience as we uh, navigate the the webinar format. I, I've I've never used the webinar format. So this is all it's a learning experience, right? We're all <laughs> every day you got to learn something new. Um, so it looks like, uh, Brad, I don't know if I can use the traditional chat. I, I'm trying to find if there's some sort of chat option, but. Um, so I do have, it looks like, uh, the option to chat with everyone uh, on my menu here. And there is also the Q&A function, which I'm seeing Kathy and Allie keep putting some things in there. Um, but yeah, if you want to just drop everything in the regular chat, there is an option where you can change it to where everybody can see the messages there. So go ahead and do that so that we can all kind of be in the same space. Uh, if that's okay. If I do see anything else hop up in the Q and A, Simon, we'll let you know. Um, okay. There, but yeah, you can go ahead and take us away if you're ready. I, yeah, I'm ready. Do you all see my screen, the title screen? We do. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and, and make the most of this. This is gonna be fun time. Um, so thank you all for being here. I, I'm excited for this session. I'm excited for uh, to explore H5P with all of you. And this is going to be as interactive as we can make it. The uh, the if you put questions, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. I I'm honestly not sure if there's a chat option. I think there's a chat. Um, uh, Ali says the chat is disabled. Um, so if you have anything to share share it in the Q&A and then I'll, I'll read it out loud or you can, I believe, I, I could be wrong, but I think all of you can use your microphones to talk too, if anyone's brave enough to do that. Um, so uh, one last thing before we get started, if you are all willing, I, I know I don't always do this as a participant, so I'm, I'm not gonna ask you to do something I don't wanna do, but if you would feel comfortable sharing your camera, I always enjoy seeing who I'm talking to, and then you can see each other, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll have some good discussion and, and uh, some things to talk about during the session. But if you don't want to, that's okay. There's a lot of times when I don't show my camera either. But Simon, this is this is Kathy. I think I put it in the Q&A earlier. I, on mine anyway, we don't have a camera option. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, which is fine. I just didn't want you to think everyone's choosing to ignore you. We just, our, our capability to interact on this end is limited to wow. unmuting our mic. We can't see anybody else. We can't see who's in the room. Wow. Um, okay. We can't see you. We can't see Brad and we can put stuff in the Q&A, but we can't see what other people put in. Well, man, thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate you letting me know. All right. Well, let's just plow ahead. Here we go. Exploring H5P, what it is, how to use it to create engaging, dynamic content for open educational resources. So um, here's a bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. And again, if you have questions, um, put them in the Q&A, or I encourage you to just talk, uh, unmute your microphone and talk if it allows you to do that. So we'll do a little bit of background about H5P so we can all uh, kind of catch up on, on um, how we got to where we are. Then we'll look at H5P and OER and how H5P fits into the OER landscape. And then we'll look at Pressbooks integration and how you can use H5P within Pressbooks. And then hopefully we'll answer a lot of questions, get a lot of discussion along the way, and uh, we'll have a good time. So H5P background. I am a huge believer in context, in in a as many areas of life as I can use it. Um, one of my examples that I like to discuss is photography. I'm a photographer. Um, it's not my my primary job or anything, but I do uh, I do take photos and I do some work for clients. And context matters. So, for instance, if you see this, what what's going on here? D this is where I would normally ask you to type in the chat, but since you can't type in the chat. If you would feel comfortable unmuting your microphone and saying your guess as to what we're looking at here, what's going on? I feel like it's the, maybe the top of a paint can. Okay, top of a paint can. It didn't get cleaned properly. Okay, didn't get cleaned properly. All right, that's great. What other things might be going on here? looks round like we're seeing part of something but not a whole something 
Yeah, it looks it looks round. You're seeing a part of something, but not the whole something. Um, oh, wow. And Brad says the chat should be turned on for everyone now. Maybe the chat's working for you all. Um, all right. Thank you, Brad. Brad is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to tinker on the back end here. I'll continue to do so, so I can try to get some of these other controls turned on. But yay for chat. Yes. Brad, thank you so much. You're I welcome. really appreciate that. Wow. <laughs> no problem. Sorry for the trouble. <laughs> it's no trouble at all. Um, it's all part of the fun. I, I enjoy this. Um, thank you all so much. So Sarah says, I would have said the paint can idea. That's my guess. Um any other guesses as to context? And says, I just keep, keep keep thinking there's no way that lid's going back on tight enough not to dry out the paint. So here's a bit of context to this image. We see this image and yeah, we can all kind of interpret our own understanding of it, but it helps to have some context so, so that we know where this is and how we got to this image. So here's me taking that picture. It is indeed a dried out can of paint. And that's my Nikon with my new favorite lens. It's a 105 millimeter macro lens. And that's the, the broader picture of that picture, but that's not even all the context. So there's more context that we need in order to really understand what this is about. It takes more than just a, st a, a, a stepped back view of the picture. We need to know information like, why was the paint dry? Uh, what was the purpose of the paint? So I bought that paint. Why Why is it all dried out? That's not That's not a good thing. Why did we, I buy the paint in the first place? Is it glotten, uh, glotten, glossy, satin, flat, or eggshell? Because that can matter as far as the purpose of the paint. And Carl Seewert, uh, yes, macro lenses are awesome. Did it get used for that purpose? So this can of paint was purchased. Why was it purchased? And did it get used for whatever we needed it to, to be used for? And how did the project turn out? And now I think one of the most important things, now what am I gonna do since the paint is all dry? In order to understand, well, we're not actually gonna answer all these questions, but it's just an illustration of why context matters. So I can't just show this picture and say, uh, tell me all about this picture. We need to know the context for this picture in order to get a, a real understanding of what's going on. For H5P, it helps to have that same sense of context. H5P was not created in a vacuum. So if you load up H5P today, you might not understand the context of why the, why these exercises, the, these interactive tools are available, what they can do, what they can't do. Um, uh, H5P was built on many years of web technologies that came and went. And understanding that context for how H5P came to be helps us see where H5P fits into the broader internet landscape and the OER landscape specifically. So let's talk interactive web content. We're going to go way back here. And um, some people in this room are going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Some people are going to say, I wasn't even born back then. Um, so let's go all the way back to 1993. There was a company called Future Wave Software, and you probably have never heard of them. They made a software called Smart Sketch probably have not heard of Smart Sketch, but this will become familiar to you. Uh, in 1995, Smart Sketch was renamed to Future Splash. And this, this Smart Sketch software was actually designed for tablets way back in 1993. We actually did have tablet computers back in 1993. They weren't very good, but they did exist. And this Future Wave Smart Sketch software was designed to have uh, to allow people to create some degree of tablet based interactive content. Molly, I used Future Splash. I bet I know where this is going. That's the context, Molly. You're exactly right. I'm sure you know where this is going, Molly. Um, in 1986, Future Splash animations were actually used on MSN.com. And here's just a couple pictures to help you understand. I don't have a lot of pictures from back in these early days because uh, there's just not a lot available. And the ones that are available are kind of difficult to find uh, open licenses to use. But uh, with uh, uh, with MSN featuring anim animations that required the Future Splash plugin, adoption skyrocketed. So the thing with the early days of the internet, you couldn't do any of this interactive stuff without a plugin. And when MSN.com featured Future Splash animations, everyone had to download a plugin in order to view these animations. In 1996, 
Macromedia bought Future Splash. Does anyone in the chat know what it became? What Future Splash was named or, or uh, uh, what the name was changed to? Yes, Molly, you got it. Molly, Carl, Jason, awesome. Extra credit for you all. Flash, that's how we got Flash. We all remember Flash, right? Flash was fun stuff. Um, here we have a screenshot of one of the most popular interactive games or experiences from way back in the day. It's uh, the Homestar Runner website. And um, you could uh, watch the little movie clips and click on little buttons. In 2002, Flash Player 6 supported full motion video, which was crazy at the time. Yes, Jamie, you know where I'm going. <laughs> and for a long time, uh, Flash was king of the hill. Everyone needed to have Flash to view this content. But in 2007, something happened. Uh, a new product was launched that uh, put the brakes on the whole operation. And I'm telling you, I'm drawing a line to H5P through all of this. Does anyone know what happened in 2007? A little product, and I mean little product, was launched that changed everything about how we interact with content on the internet. It was about this big. No one's saying in the chat. I'm, I'm trying to give a, a, Carl, you got it. It's the iPhone. That's right. In Oh, oh, whoops, I, I skipped a, a page here. YouTube, I don't know if you all remember this. In YouTube, the early days of YouTube, you actually required Flash. You could not view a YouTube video without Flash. And every time you wanted to watch a video, it said you need to download a plugin unless you had that plugin installed. And if you did have that plugin, it would say, this plugin needs to be updated. So in 2007, the iPhone was launched without Flash. You're exactly right. Um, uh, who, who said that, Carl? Oh, and Carl also said Trogdor. Trogdor. <laughs> you guys are awesome in the chat. <laughs> Carl's burning 18. Man, those were the days, right? So the iPhone was launched without Flash, and there was a good reason for that. In 2010, Steve Jobs, former CEO of Apple, um, he had he wrote what he called an open letter. Uh, it, he called it Thoughts on Flash. And if you just Google Steve Jobs Thoughts on Flash, you can pull up the PDF. I actually have the link and I'll put it in the chat, but uh, I, I, it's on a separate screen. Um, in this open letter, which is called Thoughts on Flash, Steve Jobs says, we strongly believe that all standards pertaining to the web should be open. Rather than use Flash, Apple has adopted HTML5. CSS, which means cascading style sheets, JavaScript, all of these open standards. Before that, Flash and Future Splash and all that, it was proprietary. Adobe bought Macromedia and, and Adobe basically owned Flash. It was not open. You could use Flash tools, but you had to pay for them. And you could create Flash things, but there were licenses involved and it was all controlled by Adobe. There was a lot of security risks. And Steve Jobs said, no, 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 for our iPhone, we are not going to support that. And we are going to push a future that is based on open standards. And that changed everything. And that meant that interactivity on the internet was becoming open. Open standards were seen as much better than proprietary plugins. And, and I mean, some people might say, certainly none in this room, but some people might say, well, proprietary plugins are actually better. I, I don't believe that. Open standards mean that everyone can, uh, uh, people can access these tools, people can create these tools, people can remix these tools. Um, open standards on the internet led to increased availability, increased accessibility. The audience with open standards can contribute to the content, which again, we're seeing how these, these open standards of the internet align with the, the core principles of OER. Um, there's no commercial software required to write HTML, PHP, uh, JavaScript, things like that. These advances in web standards led to greater flexibility. And you can see this, uh, this alignment here, um, which leads us up to H5P and OER. And I haven't actually touched on H5P. What, what is H5P? What, like, what does that even mean? Um, let's give a little bit of definition for that. HTML, 
stands for hypertext markup language. And really HTML is just about formatting text. So if you think if you think of a Word document and how you can make some text bold and italics and underline and things like that, you're marking that document up. And hypertext means you can link to other things. HTML is a way to mark up text. And HTML by itself doesn't really do anything. You can't control, you can't create interactive things, but HTML combined with PHP and JavaScript and these other tools does allow you to create interactive content. HTML5, which Steve Jobs mentioned in his open letter and his thoughts on Flash, it's the fifth standard of HTML, which was adopted by what we call the World Wide Web Consortium, a group that sets standards for is set, basically sets internet standards. Um, HTML is open, it's flexible, and HTML5 is multimedia focused. And that's actually the official logo for HTML5 right there. Um, it, HTML is uh, supported by all browsers. You don't need plugins to do any HTML stuff. And that leads us to H5P. Is anyone, uh, quick, Type a question mark in the chat if you're not really sure what H5P stands for. Just type a question mark. If you're if if you see that and you're like, what what is H5P? What does that mean? Yeah, Jeff, I'm not. Yep, Tara, Al, yeah, yeah, exactly, Carl. This is why context is important. It helps us understand what this is all about and how all these things are connected. And it, so this is fascinating to me. This is a session on, on H5P and OER. And a lot of us don't get what the, the acronym means. And, and that's fine. Like I didn't get what the acronym, acronym meant until I really started digging into it, which was a, so like almost a year ago. H5P simply stands for HTML5 package. That's it. H5P, HTML5 package. It's interactive elements without plugins. In fact, a, a package, an H5P, an, H, an HTML5 package is a, 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 that's like a zip file you can download and it contains the, all the, the necessary uh, computer code that you need to create interactive web content. H5P, HTML5 packages are open. Anyone can edit them, they, anyone can create them. They're flexible and they're multimedia focused. And I've got a very short video. It's actually uh, put out by the H5P, by, by the group that, that started H5P. Uh, I'm gonna show it to you here. I'm gonna attempt to share a different window on my screen. It's like 50 seconds long. It's really short. So if it doesn't work, that's fine. We'll do a, uh, oops, my screen share. There it is. Okay, here we go. Five P allows websites to create richer and more interactive content. The content works just as well on mobiles and tablets as on desktop. Rich interactive content can be shared and reused across websites. That's it. That's um, let me stop that share and go back to the original share. So H5P, HTML5 packages, they are ideal for open educational resources. Um, they combine the open web with open pedagogy. Um, and if we go back to the early days of Flash and Future Splash and plugins and all that, those were not open. And if we had open pedagogy with a closed web, with closed web standards, it would not be the, the best way to go about having interactive content. So it's really good that these things have all aligned. Um, anyone can use, edit, remix, and create uh, H5P, HTML5 packages. Um, you can embed H5P in websites uh, <laughs> or uh, systems like Pressbooks without commercial plugins. Um, you, there's support for uh, learning management systems like Canvas, Bright, Brightspace, Blackboard, Moodle, um, content management system support like WordPress, Drupal, Drupal, and, well, we're not going to dwell on that, but um, we're, how many, as we get into the next part of the presentation, um, how many people in the chat are familiar with 
WordPress, because there's a reason I mentioned WordPress here. Is anyone familiar with WordPress? Maybe you have a WordPress blog. Maybe you have a, a self-hosted WordPress. Molly says, yep. Tara says, yep. Ali, Ali is. And if you're not, that's fine. You don't have to be familiar with WordPress. But H2, H5P works really well on WordPress, specifically the Pressbooks platform, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, Jareth, I ran a WordPress website for a few years. Yes, Pressbooks, exactly. I love that you guys are are, are pointing in this direction. Like you can all see where this is going. Um, uh, I, I I still run some WordPress websites and uh, um, it's, a, it's a great platform. Um, so how do you get started with H5P? And I, I will, what I'm going to do here is walk you through how to kind of get started, but then I'm going to give you a demonstration of H5P and we'll kind of do this in real time. Um, if you want to pull up a second window, that's fine. Um, like a, a new tab in your browser or something and, and kind of follow along with me, that's fine. But then we are going to do a demonstration so that you can all watch this unfold in real time as well. So if you go to h5p.org, you can create a free account. And here's the thing with, with H5P. That computer code has to run somewhere. Um, you need to sit on a server so it can execute the commands in the code. H5P.org is a, a place to that, that will host your content if you need it. Like, for instance, Ali, um, the, Ali's over at Langston. And Ali, um, if I'm not mistaken, which I might be mistaken, I believe you, uh, Langston has an agreement with H5P.org to host H5P content. Is that right? Um, well, Dr. Sultani's on, so he could explain it better, but it goes into our canvas. Okay. Um, the the uh, Even though H5P runs on, like the, the elements of H5P are all open um, and anyone can create and edit H5P, that code still needs to sit on a server somewhere and that server needs to be equipped to run PHP scripts and things like that. And H5P will, do that for you, but it does cost some money because they have to do that. Or you can do it yourself. And if you have Word or if you have Pressbooks, Pressbooks has H5P integration, and uh, it it you don't need you don't need to pay H5P.org. So I don't want to um, I want to be careful in in making sure we're setting expectations. H5P is free; it's open. You don't have to pay anything, but you do have to have that code run somewhere, and uh, you can run that code on H5P.org for a, uh, a fee, which I think is pretty reasonable, or you can run your own server. Like you can build your own web server and run the code there. Uh, that's fine. Um, or if you have Pressbooks, you can use H5P through Pressbooks. Ali, uh, yes, just raise your hand. Yes, Ali. I was going to say, and Dr. Sultani is on, so he could say more, but I think the things that we are paying for, they said would be things like they talked about hosting it and that they'll give like training and stuff like that. Like they okay. made it clear that this, that this is that there's an option to do it for free. Okay. They they did say that and that we're paying more for like services. Okay. Um, so if you go to H5P and I, Ali, I really appreciate the context there. Thank you. And, and the, the extra information. If you go to H5P.org, um, you can navigate to one of the options on the top, which is uh, it'll take you to content types and applications. And then you can scroll through and see all the H5P tools that are available. And these are all interactive elements and they all do different things. Um, you can see the title of some of these. There's an accordion where there's a vertically stacked list of expandable items. Um, there's uh, uh, some interactive quizzes. There's audio recorder. There's all kinds of interactive tools. And if you're like me and you grew up on Flash plugins, it's just like a miracle that this works without any plugins. It's amazing. And the fact that this is the, the code is actually open and, and people can uh, create their own H5P and really contribute to this, it's really amazing. So let's look at Pressbooks and how it integrates with Pressbooks. And the reason I'm, I'm choosing Pressbooks is because there's um, it's one of the, the most widely used um, OER publishing platforms. So uh, specifically uh, like OCO has, a, uh, has Pressbooks and a lot of schools here in Oklahoma use Pressbooks. So we're gonna look at Pressbooks and I'm gonna go through this uh, through this with you with some screenshots, but then we're actually going to go into uh, a Pressbooks example and I'll kind of walk you through this in real time instead of just screenshots. But if you have Pressbooks, uh, if you have access to Pressbooks and you wanna pull up a new tab in your browser and kind of follow along, that's fine too. I would love to have that. 
Um, so once you're in a Pressbooks book, oh yeah, hey, thanks, Brad. I, I appreciate that. Brad says, make sure to catch the session at 1 p.m. on creating your OER in Pressbooks. Um, and Dr. Sultani, we're going to use H5P cloud version with 30 authors. And uh, if you're interested in that, uh, uh, I'm sure Dr. Sultani can provide more information on what that's all about as well. Um, if you want to use H5P with Pressbooks, log into Pressbooks and go to your dashboard. And there'll be an option that says H5P content. <laughs> you may have to check with a Pressbooks administrator to make sure H5P is enabled, but it's a really, it's just a, like a checkbox. Um, and then from there, you'll say add new. And I'll walk you through this in a second. This is just like a broad overview. Um, the first thing that happens when you want to add new uh, H5P is it's going to say, um, uh, it's going to ask you to link it with the h5p.org servers. And you say, yes, that's fine. And then you'll have this list of tools that you can browse through, which is the same list of tools that you'll see on h5p.org. You can click into them and try them out. And again, I, I will show you in a little interactive um, walkthrough in just a minute here. Um, you can look at uh, the different options. You can try them out and start creating H5P. And then um, you can actually add them to part of your Pressbooks, like a, a, a chapter in your Pressbooks book. You go over to um, the add H5P option, and then you just select one of the H5P tools that you want to insert. So let's demonstrate that. Th those screenshots probably don't make a whole lot of sense. So let's just demonstrate it so that you can see it in real time. I'm going to stop the screen share and then switch to my browser window and then start. I'm also going to pause, take a breath, take a drink of water and see if any questions are, uh, if you have any questions, comments, things to share in the chat while I switch to the other screen. Uh, let's see, just a couple comments came in. Um, if you're teaching an Oklahoma institution, with the exception of OU, you can sign up for a free account on our open OCO Pressbooks network. And there's a link there. And then OSU faculty, we already have Pressbooks and you can get, uh, you can go to our Pressbooks at open.library.okstate.edu. And uh, are we supposed to go to that link? Um, Oh, no, you, you don't need to, Allie. Um, you can do that later and just save those links and, and go to that later. Um, if you do have access to Pressbooks and want to follow along on your own, as I'm doing it here, that's fine. And if not, that's fine, too. Um, you can just watch this. And I believe these sessions are recorded and available for viewing later. Is that right, Brad? That is correct, right. Simon. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is my Pressbooks backend. And I asked about WordPress earlier. Pressbooks is actually, and, and some people know this, some people don't, it's actually a forked version of WordPress. The core uh, uh, code that makes WordPress is open and anyone can download WordPress, the, the core uh, software of WordPress and create your own WordPress site. And what Pressbooks did is they took WordPress and they basically, they, they made their own version specifically designed for um, the type of publishing that we do in, uh, or that's ideal in the open education resources community. And so a lot of what you'll see here will look really familiar if you have been using Pressbooks. This, the interface here is actually more like WordPress five or six. And, uh, and that's fine. They, they've really taken this and they've refined it a lot. Newer WordPress has a whole bunch of stuff that isn't necessarily related to the OER uh, world. And the Pressbooks is just great for getting stuff published, uh, for getting open materials published. And it's a really solid, stable platform. And I really like that. Um, so once you're in Pressbooks, this is a kind of a, a testing book. It's like a, a, a sandbox playground book that I used to, uh, to construct a, a book that um, I, I just use for like demonstrations now. I've got a chapter in this book called Parts of Speech. And in this Parts of Speech, 
I have uh, used the following tool to assess your own knowledge about the parts of speech. And I just need to make sure I'm following along properly on my notes here as well. Don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So we need an interactive tool to assess our knowledge of the parts of speech. If I go over here to H5P content, that's where I can add H5P. And incidentally, if I go to plugins, this is where I can see I've got a few plugins that are available that we have installed on our, our OSU instance of uh, Pressbooks. H5P is one of them. If you don't see H5P, you might also check the plugins and then make sure that H5P is activated. And you can click it and there'll be, just like here, it says activate, activate, activate. H5P has already been activated. So the only option is to deactivate it. But if you don't see H5P in your Pressbooks, you might just check the plugins and make sure that you have H5P activated. So I'm gonna go over to H5P content. And if I click all H5P content, uh, there's nothing available. I actually have to create something. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go over to add new. And here I get this list of H5P content. And all of these are free tools that you can use. And then you can actually, if you want, actually download the code and change this if you really want to dig into the, the nitty gritty of the JavaScript and the PHP code. Or you can just use the interactive um, interface here. If we click on one of these, you can get like a little preview of it. You can get a demo of it and then decide, yeah, maybe that's not what I want to do. Uh, maybe the summary thing would be good and you can do a demo and then say, May maybe not. Um, in this case, I want to use dialogue cards. It's one of my favorite H5P activities. It's simple, but it's really effective, especially for self-checks and reviews. If you embed dialogue cards in a, uh, in uh, a chapter of a, of a book, it's like little flashcards and students can see a, some sort of prompt and you can even embed audio in them and then they can try something on their own and then click the card and it'll turn over to reveal the answer. And it seems kind of simple, but it's those little interactive elements go a long way towards engaging your students and helping make sure that they're following along with the content. So I'm going to click on dialogue cards and this is actually the, the interface where I can start creating my, uh, my H5P interactive dialogue card. So we'll kind of walk through this. Every one of these is a little different, by the way. So all of these options here that you'll see on the dialogue cards look a little different than the options that you'll see for some of the others, like chart or column or drag the words. So when I'm showing you this, it's not going to look one-to-one. -one. It's not going to be exactly the same as what you see on the rest, but you can get help for these pretty easily if you click on um, details here. You can get the content demo um, that will uh, uh, take you over to, I believe that takes you to the h5p.org website. And um, there's a lot of tutorials that you can find on h5p.org for each of these as well. So let's actually do this. I'm going to click on add new, click on dialog cards, and there's all these fields. For the title, I'm going to call it parts of speech. Heading, we'll just give it a, a we'll call it chapter one uh, preview or review. For mode, we'll just leave it as normal. And if you want to do repetition, that's fine. But I like to just leave it as normal. Uh, for task description, I'm going to say define each of the parts of speech. And now I can create my dialogue cards. So in the top, and this is kind of abstract. I'll show you a demonstration of what this looks like when we actually make it go live here. For the text, I'm going to put um, person place, thing, or idea. Does anyone know what that is, what the part of speech for that is? That's right. It's a noun. Thanks, Anne. So we'll do noun. And this is just a self-check. It's just a really simple self-check. So students are going to see person, place, thing, or idea, and they'll have to do the same thing. They'll have to think like, well, what is that? I remember that we covered that before, and then they can flip the card over and see, oh yeah, it is noun. 
If you want to add a picture, you can do that, which is great. Um, if you're if you're doing some sort of visual review, you can had you can put up a picture and then have students identify the picture or ask them a question about the picture, and then they can flip it over to see the answer. Um, if there's image, make sure to put alt text, which uh, again speaks to the accessible nature of H5P, how accessibility is kind of built into it. Um, you can even include audio files. One of the demos that works great for this is having, a, a, if you're doing a, a press books book on um, a secondary language or another language, you can test students by uh, recording a word or a, or a phrase and then having them think about the translation. Then they flip the card over and they see if their translation is correct. Things like that. We're not going to do any of that. We're just going to go person, place, thing, or idea, noun, and Let's add another dialogue then. And we'll do an action, occurrence, or state of being. And that is a verb. And then we'll add one more dialogue, which is describes a noun. And that would be an adjective. So I've now created my the different cards, the dialogue cards. I'm going to then finish this all up by clicking the create button. Now my H5P tool is ready to go. And here you can actually see it. It's it's super cool. You don't need a plugin to do any of this. So a student sees this. They see parts of speech, chapter one review, define each of the parts of speech. And it says person, place, thing, or idea. And the student's going to read that and think, well, it's probably a noun. Turn it over. And it's a noun. And then that's card one of three. So then you can uh, flip to the next card, an action occurrence state of being. Uh, and they would think, well, it's probably a verb. And sure enough, it's a verb. And then just like before, describes a noun, turn it over. And there it is. It describes, uh, it's an adjective, which describes a noun. But how do I get this in that chapter? How do I take this cool thing here and, and get that actually in that parts of speech chapter? And that trips people up sometimes. A couple ways to do it. Um, it gives you a little short code here. So what it did is it built an H5P tool using that visual editor. And you can get the code if you really want to and, and edit the actual code itself. I don't. I just edit using the visual editor. Um, but it has to refer to that code somehow. When you pull up a chapter in Pressbooks, you have to tell it where to stick that code to launch that this interactive tool. And this is the little notation that you want to copy and paste. But there's an easier way to do it, even easier than that. And I'll show you that. So this H5P content has been created. Um, if I click on all H5P content, it should now show up. There it is, my parts of speech. It's a dialogue card. And if you remember a little, little while ago, I clicked all H5P content and it, this was empty. But now we can see it. So how do I get that in the chapter? Well, if I go to Organize, and I'm in my Pressbooks book and I go to parts of speech, we'll edit that. And now if I click on add H5P, this is in one of my screenshots before, but this is much more instructive if I just walk you through it. If I click add H5P, here it is, my parts of speech dialogue cards insert. And there it just inserted that short code. That's all it did. You can copy and paste that short code if you want to, but, um, uh, it's it just took care of that for you because if you have a lot of these like 20 or 30 of these it's a lot of short codes to remember so if you just click this add h5p button it will load the h5p materials that you've already created and then you just select one so i'm going to save it and now if i view this chapter parts of speech use the following tool to assess your own knowledge of the parts of speech and there it is there's my interactive h5p element i can turn that over it's a noun Go to the next one, turn it over, it's a verb, and it describes a noun, it's an adjective, and I can retry it. This is a fantastic tool that uh, it still kind of blows my mind that we can do this without plugins. And it has all the benefits of OER. So not only is it great for OER, it follows the principles of OER, uh, of reusing and remixing and, and uh, uh, having users contribute to the H5P community. You can even, uh, click this embed code here, and this will give you, if you copy this, you can then go to Canvas and embed this iframe into a page in Canvas. But what is happening here, it, and it will load that H5P in Canvas, and I assume in others like uh, Moodle and 
um, Blackboard. But what it's happening here is actually it's loading, it's telling Canvas or wherever you embed and, and copy and paste this, it's telling it to load this content from OSU's instance of Pressbooks. So you, you still need a place for that H5P code to sit and it's sitting in our Pressbook. So if I put this in my Canvas course, it's going to reference this Pressbooks to load the code that's running that H5P. And then our Pressbooks is actually <laughs> hooked up. It's equipped to run that H5P code. So be careful when you're embedding things this way, um, because if the original source changes, like if I were to embed this in my Canvas, but then delete this Pressbooks, uh, th this chapter in Pressbooks, now it goes away in my Canvas too, because it's referencing this through that Pressbooks. Great question, Kathy. Uh, so students can access it through their Canvas. Will it auto-grade? It won't auto-grade that way. There are ways to do auto-grading with some of these H5P tools, but you typically have to use, uh, Canvas calls it an LTI integration. And when you when you embed or when you use H5P with that LTI integration, then I believe you can do some of the auto grading. This will just let students use the activity and not, it's not tied towards any sort of, uh, any sort of grading. And that's, I, I believe where things get a little more complicated when you start digging into the LMS integration. In fact, um, Molly says uh, in the chat, we have H5P through Pressbooks, but it, it isn't integrated with Blackboard. Um, and uh, uh, another good question, Kathy, will Canvas measure whether or not they did it? Just click into the activity. Canvas does not have great metrics for things like this, unfortunately. Um, what you could do in Canvas is create a page specifically for this. And uh, a lot of people in Canvas, they'll create a page and they'll have um, uh, some text and some videos and they'll have a lot of things in that Canvas page. And then it, they would include this embed code. Canvas would only be able to tell if a student access that page, not whether they actually did any of the activities. But if you created a Canvas page and only had the embedded code for this H5P, then you'd be able to tell if your students actually did visit that page. Jason says, we've tested H5P LTI integration for auto grading. It seems to work well so far. Jason, you probably have more experience with the auto grading side of things than I do. So um, if anyone is curious about the, the auto grading and this LTI integration, Jason, it sounds like uh, has, has some experience. Jason, what LMS do you use? Is it Canvas or is it another one like Blackboard or Moodle? Okay. Oh, um, Jason Henderson. Thank you, Kathy. Um, uh, Jason Henderson said, um, we have tested H5P LTI integration for auto grading. It seems to work well so far, and they're using Canvas. What school are you at, Jason? Uh, just out of curiosity. Langston. Okay. So Jason Henderson uh, at Langston. If uh, Jason, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, um, but uh, I'm, I'm following up because you said it in the chat. Would you mind if anyone who's interested in... in uh, investigating that a little more, would you mind if so, if people would uh, uh, contact you? <laughs> um, again, I, that's not what you signed up for. And uh, if if not, then I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn or anything. Um, but uh, it sounds like you've got some exper experience with this. And if people had some basic questions, um, uh, Jay, okay, thank you. Uh, Jason says, no, that would be fine. We're in early days, though. And I appreciate you saying that. And I, I really don't mean to put you in the spot. And uh, if someone has some basic questions, Jason said you, you could contact him. And uh, uh, Jason said, we're in our early days, though. So if uh, if the scope of what you need is beyond what Jason could provide, then um, that's fine. Um Let's see. And Kathy said, uh, I imagine the, uh, she said, ah, that's good to hear. I imagine the Pressbooks LTA integration would function similarly. I believe so. Um, and Jamie says, I've done quite a bit with building an uh, informative feedback. So far, that's been the most useful thing about H5P and Pressbooks for me and the projects I've worked on. I mean, I really appreciate the comments being shared in this chat because the amount of experience that people have with H5P is, is all over the map. And it sounds like we've got some people who are really uh, knee deep into this and using it in, in um, uh, really digging into some of these integrations and using it in really ri uh, rich ways within the learning management system. And some people who are totally new to it. 
And that's fine. That's part of what makes this conference so great is we're connecting everybody in these ways. I'm going to stop this screen share because we only have just a couple minutes left. And go back to my PowerPoint, uh, which I think only has one slide left. So there's not really much to show. I... Okay, that's it. We're at the end. <laughs> um, so that about does it for H5P. And uh, I... My goal here was to help you understand a bit of context for H5P. So how did we get here? Where did we start? Um, what, it, what does all this mean? And then where are we going? And I really appreciate all the comments in the chat. You guys asked great questions. Thank you to those who offered to share information either in the chat or connect with people outside of the chat. I really appreciate that. And um, uh, uh, if you have questions about, about H5P, you can contact me. I'll do my best to... Uh, answer the questions or at least put you in touch with others who can. And we have about three minutes where I'm going to uh, just take a breath, take a drink of water and see if there's any other questions that show up in the chat. Molly says, I'd be very interested in talking with anyone who's using the LTI integration. And then she has her email address. Simon, I just want to point out that I know uh... The online consortium of Oklahoma is doing a series of technology grants to its member institutions, and we have a couple of them out there that are looking at this H5P integration with the learning management system. So I'm really excited to see some of the research that we're going to actually be able to gather on this particular tool. And I would just encourage everybody here to go and create a Pressbooks account and start playing around there because the great part about creating H5P activities, like Simon said, is they can be transferred anywhere. You can download those packages and put them into a learning management system. You can do it via embed code. Uh, it's just such a dynamic tool that exists in multiple places there. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see this. And also I think all of our state system institutions received grant funding as well to try out the Pressbooks grade passback feature. So if you're interested in using Pressbooks for that purpose, there may be some funds available to cover the cost of that that would normally be going to your students. So yeah, That's like multiple chances to try out H5P. Across thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I really appreciate that, Brad. Um, and uh jo uh, Joanna in the chat says, uh, I followed you here from the Open Ed Conference. Great. Thanks, Joanna. Um, and I appreciate, uh, uh, I just want to make sure there are some people who aren't able to read the chat, so I'm trying to repeat it. Um, uh, uh, someone said that uh, the context was helpful. I appreciate that. And if, um, if there are uh, uh, opportunities to do that, like there, there's so many ways in which you can use these H5P tools. And I encourage you to uh, to explore this and, and explore some of the opportunities that Brad mentioned as well. Um, Jamie just had one other question. It says, Pressbook grade passback. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, and I, that's the LTI from Pressbooks to oh, your LMS. Okay. So that means that the graded items in uh, Pressbooks, like your H5P activities there, if they are scored, you can actually have that connected to an item in your grade book of a course so that it's automated. And that's one of the best parts about, again, H5P and Pressbooks together is that's a gap that's filled by publishers, you know, with the content that they have is connecting to your LMS and making some things auto graded. So lots of good opportunity out there. Yeah, I was I was talking to uh, I'm working with a, a gerontology professor and we met this morning and talked about the the OER textbook he's making and he's he's asking his students about the book and one of the things they talked about was interactive content and this is in a uh, it's in a um, an OER textbook so it's an open textbook and his students are he and I are planning some of these H5P tools and his students are asking for H5P tools. And this is like the fact that we have access to this without plugins and without uh, all this extra stuff. It's just amazing. Um, Ali has your hand up. So I want to make sure to get to that. And then it's 1150. So I don't want to run over time, but Ali, was there something quick? Okay. All right. Well, Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, everyone. I always enjoy these sessions. I have a great time doing this. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And thank you to all the, in the chat who offered to share information and connect to people that way. And um, yeah, Brad, take it away. Thank you, Simon.